everybody. Welcome back to this week's episode of Tales of the Resistance. This is a podcast about anti corporate resistance hosted by members of the I Am Responsible team, a nationwide extension and outreach team focused on anti corporate resistance and how we can all fight the coming crisis. My name is Mara, and I'm one of the regular hosts of the podcast and the project manager with the I Am Responsible team. I'm going to be joined today by our social media professional, Beth. Hi, everybody. Good to be back again. And by our favorite doctor, PhD in civil engineering, Noelle Atieno Mori. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Noelle, and welcome to our podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Well, today we're continuing with our series, uh, answering the questions from the audience. And We have had so many questions that this series has gone on a lot longer than we expected, but we're coming towards the end of the the questions that have been submitted so far, though, of course, people are welcome to continue to submit on our social media feeds or find us at our website now live at iamrproject.com, but we'll continue to answer some more questions today, so let's go ahead and get into it. Next question. Is it true that meat purchased from supermarkets contains antibiotic resistant bacteria? My first answer is yes, because AMR is everywhere. That's not to say there aren't regulations on meat producers and things, but it also made me think, so I was reading an article about shrimp farm imports to Canada and about how regulators caught a high number of um, AMR in those imports. So I think maybe some meat has more AMR bacteria than others, but I think that comes down to uh, how far along maybe the country or industry has come in regulations. For instance, the cattle industry in the U.S., is more regulated on its use of antibiotics than the shrimp farms in East Asia and India. That's where most shrimp farms are. But yeah, essentially it's everywhere, but maybe where the meat is produced has an effect on how much antibiotics are used in it, et cetera, which causes antimicrobial resistance. Well, I do think that there's a, a global, there's differences globally, like you said, in terms of the regulations and and not just in the terms of regulations in how antimicrobials are used, but I think that to answer this question is really important to understand all of the work that is done within the food production system to keep your food safe. It's probably been, but I don't know off the top of my head when the FDA and some of those agencies started, USDA and stuff started doing food inspections, but it's it's more than a hundred years, I would guess. And a lot of science and understanding, processing within plants to preserve food better, all of that stuff, like the, the how we train workers and how farmers, machines harvest crops and harvest animals and eggs and milk, how they are processed within processing plants. And then when you get to the grocery store, keeping foods cool, that should say cool, separation of meats from fruits and vegetables. Um, All of that stuff is also important for keeping, limiting contamination of food. So all along the pathway, there, there's a lot of work, research that's been done and ongoing um, application of that research within many industries to make sure that your food stays as free of pathogens as possible. Is it perfect? No, it's not. But, which is all to say that you're right that there probably is antimicrobial resistance in food, because anywhere that there's a significant amount of bacteria, there's going to be antimicrobial resistance. But there is a lot of infrastructure to reduce the number of microbes in your food, and all of those things, all of those interventions are effective against antimicrobial resistant pathogens, generally speaking. There are regulations to ensure that uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria do not end up in the supermarkets. 
But I also sort of agree with Beth where she comes in and says, maybe there are less stringent regulations in other say developing countries as they put it. And so that way you may find antimicrobial resistant bacteria in higher proportions compared to that say in areas where there's a lot more stringent regulations. And so in as much as organizations, international organizations have paved way and created rules to help with dealing with antimicrobial, with M, the issue of AMR, it's not equal across all areas or all countries. And so with that to say, it depends what antimicrobials or antimicrobials used to say for the promotion of growth of the animals. For instance, that has been curtailed by the Food and Agricultural Organization since I think 2014. So the promotion of the use of antimicrobials for the promotion of growth, there was a common use previously, but most recently it's no longer allowed. You're only allowed to use antibiotics, say, in order to help when an animal is sick, in order to help them get better, but you cannot use it for growth promotion. And so if that's the case, then there is less antimicrobial resistant bacteria in the food that you get from the supermarket. Not to say that it's not there, but only to say that there are rules that are set in place in order to minimize the exposure of humans from antimicrobial resistant bacteria that comes from uh, animal production. Yes, yes. What I am tr- was trying to get at with all of the stuff about regulation is just that the food, food is generally safe. But you know that even with all of that regulation, layers of regulations and inspections and interventions within the food chain, there are outbreaks every year from foodborne pathogens, even in the United States. Obviously, this is a global problem and the conditions elsewhere are, this is not the same story in all cases. But we know that sometimes those food born pathogens get through. And we know that because in any large, like I said, any large population of bacteria, some of them are resistant. That means that some of those pathogens who make it through all of those interventions could well be antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And I guess I wanted to point out that First of all, it's not just meat. You can certainly get antimicrobial resistance on fruits and vegetables by contamination from wastewater, from handling of the food by people who are are processing it. And so that's why it's important what we do in the home. And we've said this many times before, I think, the importance of food safety in the home as the, the last step before a foodborne pathogen can get to you, it has to basically get through you, all your defenses. And that includes your interventions, such as cooking your food, cleaning your fruits and vegetables, separating foods that you're going to eat raw from meats and dairy and that sort of thing. So those are all interventions that you can do at the home to make sure that pathogens, no matter what kind of pathogens they are, antimicrobial resistance or not, are not able to actually uh, get to you and create an infection. Next question. Is antimicrobial use in farm animals responsible for the spread of resistant bacteria? And on this one, well, we can say that yes, yes, it will play a role, but then everything plays a role. It's not just antimicrobial use in farm animals. They're not the only one responsible, you know, hospitals, doctors overprescribing antibiotics, patients not taking their whole dose of antibiotics or not disposing of them properly, um, wastewater treatments not efficient enough to weed out bacteria with AMR, etc. So there's a lot of different reasons for um, AMR. It's not just one industry's fault. Yeah, that was my thought is just, it's not just farm animals, you know, it's everybody that's responsible. You covered it pretty well. I have nothing to add other than we are all responsible. Yeah, I agree. I, and I, I do want to say like, it matters how close things are to you. In reality, how, how much effect does 
giving an antimicrobial, an antibiotic to a dairy cow likely to impact you? What is the risk factor between antimicrobial resistance on a farm to how it impacts us? They're a long way away in terms of the number of interventions, space, and time generally that will be between the cow or the, and the milk on the farm and you consuming the cow or the milk. Um, and that goes back to all the food processing steps and regulations that are involved. But that doesn't mean that there isn't antimicrobial resistance on the meat. Antimicrobial resistance, you can find it almost anywhere because it's a gene in many, many species that they develop with resistance. And But really, you know, when we talk about levels of risk, it is most dangerous when antimicrobial resistance is in a pathogen. And there are many microbes that can survive all of the processing and regulation and everything better than pathogens because pathogens are pathogens in some places and not others. And anything that is going to be a pathogen to us has to be something well adapted to live inside us. And conditions that are used to treat food are very different than those that are inside us. And so species that are best able to survive that process are not those that are usually, not usually, super pathogenic to us. And that just means that those microbes that could be carrying antimicrobial resistance may not be pathogenic. Okay, ready? Next question. Why are antimicrobials used in food producing animals? I think Noel started talking about this a little bit before. Previously, we have used antimicrobials in food producing animals for growth promotion. Basically, that's a way to improve the efficiency of meat and animal product production. We want to improve the efficiency of production. And they're not, it's not just about the bottom line, that's about input efficiency, using less water, less feed to make more meat. So those are all reasons why you would want to use growth promoting products. However, we know that growth promotion use of antibiotics can select for antimicrobial resistance. So in uh, the last few years here in the United States and previously in Europe, much uh, many of those countries have banned the use of antimicrobials for growth promotion purposes only. Now you have, they have to be used under the guidance of a veterinarian and given to animals for treating diseases or to prevent diseases at times that they expect that animals are likely to become ill because of physiological stresses that is likely to make them susceptible to disease. And I think if you think about it in those terms, the fact that we use antimicrobials to treat sick animals, I don't know anyone who would say we should not use antimicrobials for food producing animals. I know that people are concerned about what is in their food, but there is a pretty extensive network of observation to be sure that the antibiotics are not going to get in your food because animals receiving antibiotics can't be harvested until it's run out of their system, can't use the milk from a cow that's being given antibiotics until it's come out of their system. So you're not likely to get the antibiotics themselves. Antimicrobial resistance is kind of everywhere as we've been discussing. There are food interventions that can reduce your risk of getting AMR infections by, you know, basic food safety. And I think that there aren't very many people who would say we don't want to treat animals who are sick. So given that, I think you kind of have to give them something. The, the, there's all kind of quibbles to be made about the level, but. And also, Mara, just to note the informed animals, uh, in case these animals that have been found to be sick, mostly they are separated from the other herd. And so they're put in a confined area where they're not interacting with animals. And then that's where they're administered antibiotics. 
So there are practices that are put in place to ensure that you like humans may not come into contact with antibiotics from, from animals and some of the ways that what Mara have suggested. However, I feel like it's important to mention that this is not everywhere. It may be true in the United States of America, it may be true in the UK, but this is not true, see, in other areas where uh, the resources are kind of limited and they don't have all these resources that the developed countries do have in place. And I just thought that that's important to not. Yeah, that's always an important part of the story that AMR is a huge global global issue and our food chain is global. So differences in regulations are important to be aware of and take into account when you are making your food purchases and how you manage that food at your home. And that kind of takes us into the next question if we are good to go. The next question is, who is responsible for approving the use of agricultural antimicrobials? And I, I guess we've touched on this quite a bit so far in terms of the United States changing the law to require medically important antibiotics used for food animals that require veterinary oversight. I have a question about this one. I did think, yes, for the U.S., like the FDA, but also does who? I think it's who. The World Health Organization. Yeah. Okay, so I was reading this article about how the FDA had recently updated, or I don't know how old this article was. Anyway, so it had updated its list of what antibiotics they should or shouldn't be using. And it was just saying in the article that all the antibiotics that the United States says is all right or isn't all right to use doesn't exactly match um, what they've got on who, but that's just because, you know, we have different concerns in our country than other countries. So another country will have different antibiotic um, regulations and another one. But if a country wants to implement uh, some sort of regulation, then they do have who to go off of what like are the major ones they should regulate. I think you, you're making sense. You're trying to figure out if the World Health Organization is a governing body to make rules on antimicrobial resistance. And from my opinion, I believe they do make recommendations but then it's upon those countries to take them up or not. They have a um, recommendation whether or not a country is either follows it or is even capable of following it. You know, some countries might not be at the point that they are able to even uh, regulate all those antibiotics. <laughs> you know, when we talk about AMR, it's not just something that affects humans. I mean, that's the main concern because it's humans, you know, that are dying. But it also is going to affect um, our uh, meat producing industries, you know, our dairy farms and our pet, they can all be affected by AMR as well. Yes. And I, I think that that is a point, a, a messaging point that is valuable to us when we're talking to food producers about antimicrobial resistance. This goes back to some of the questions about who is responsible how much does antimicrobial resistance is coming from meat production? Those are ideas that are in the public. There's a lot of changes being made about how we're advertising how meat is produced, you know, raised without antibiotics movement and such. And I think that, at least in my experience, talking to folks about this, there is a tendency to feel like the public doesn't understand that they're trying to help the health of their animals and you know they're just blaming them for this problem and we need to use as much antibiotics as we need to use I'm the best judge of my animal's health and to some extent I would agree with the idea that there is some misconceptions among the public on why antimicrobials are used in animals but there's also, I think, for the farmers, they're overlooking what you just said, Beth, that there is a major a potential for a major impact on their ultimate bottom lines 
and the health of their animals if they overuse or injudiciously use antimicrobials long term, because it will make those antimicrobials less effective for treating their animals. So I think it's important that we include that message there as well. And I think that we are regulating the use of certain classes entirely requiring veterinary advice within animals. All antimicrobial use for animals or for people, we could do better in terms of judicious use. And I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here. I apologize. <laughs> but it's something that um, is really interesting to me in terms of how we better use antimicrobials in animals is that animals, unlike people, can't tell us when they're sick, right? And if there's a big part of trying to improve the use of antimicrobials is in people is to only use antimicrobials for people who have bacterial infections, not viral, who are, and for as narrow a type of antimicrobial or antibiotic intervention to the specific species of disease that you have. And we talked about that before in terms of like diagnostics and stuff. But for animals, the same rules would apply in the sense that the ideal situation is that you treat the one animal who is sick with the very specific type of drug that they need to get over that infection. But it is just so much harder when you're talking about animals because they can't as easily verbalize what they're suffering. So they more quickly spread it to each other because it's harder to see who is sick very quickly. And I'll just just say that the, the thing that interests me there is that there's a lot of research being done in what's called precision animal management to build AI and sensors and things to more quickly identify sick animals with the purpose of basically pulling them out of the herd, like Noel was saying, as quickly as possible, preventing spread of disease and treating that one animal. I think that's a really interesting point of research and a cool sort of futuristic farm AI sort of combinations <laughs> that uh, people probably don't know that much about and is, is a cool thing to think about. Yeah, that is really interesting. I hadn't known that. And it sounds like that would be really beneficial because like Noelle was saying, they try to get the animal out right away from the herd, separate them. And that is a, a good thing to do. But as Mara was also saying, you can't tell right away if an animal is sick. So it kind of makes sense if a farmer was like, okay, then let me just treat my whole herd as like a preventative measure and if that's the way they're thinking that kind of makes sense because you can't tell if an animal is sick but at the same time it's also contributing to then antimicrobial resistance but as we were talking about beforehand about this and farmers contributing it made me think that it could be that feeling of it's not going to happen to me. Go back to COVID. It, it's not going to happen to me, that attitude and feeling about it. And you can think of that. I'm sure that comes up with, with something like, oh, it's not going to be me whose antibiotic isn't going to work one day. It's, you know, somebody else, which can, all, can kind of lower the risk, the feeling of risk factor. And someone, if they don't take the threat very personally, it's more of a, out there threat to somebody else. So it might be that when you're talking about maybe a farmer thinking, well, I gotta give all my cows, you know, or whatever it is, all their antibiotics just to be safe in the moment kind of thinking, very immediate thinking. And just like, ah, well, it won't be my cows or whatever that get that it's antibiotic eventually won't work or something like that. Yeah, short-term thinking, well, is the bane of our existence with things like climate change and and antimicrobial resistance being um, primary examples of these massive, wicked problems, as they're called, you know, systemic challenges that require huge changes from all kinds of people to prevent very significant future harm that people are just, we, we find that it is difficult to organize ourselves and address them 
for whatever reason, <laughs> we're just not good at that as a species. I think I'm laughing because you called human species. Just another right? species. <laughs> we could be pathogenic to people. We don't know. Not people, but other you know, species. aliens. Right? That's funny. Some alien's going to try and eat us one day and then they're going to get sick. We'll be foodborne pathogens, guys. <laughs> foodborne pathogens. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us on today's podcast. Had a lot of good questions, so keep them coming. We've got some more episodes coming up with some more questions to answer. I found these all interesting, learning a lot. I hope you are too. So um, we'll sign off and see you next time. Thank you all for joining. 